Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Inside Israel. I'm Joel Chasnoff coming to you tonight from back in Israel. I'm Ra'anan, in Ra'anana after a week in the U.S. back home. And wow, so much to talk about tonight. This is one of those, uh, it's happened a few times that I've been with you when I've said that there's actually a chance that during the broadcast, I might have to go to the bomb shelter. We're not expecting fire on the center of the country tonight, but we're all on uh, high alert given everything that's going on here. And that's really what we're going to focus on in tonight's episode. Tonight's broadcast is called, You Know That War Joel's Been Talking About? And I'm sure you can all guess why it's called that. And we will get to that in a moment. But first I have what I consider an exciting announcement. So Tonight, I am actually launching a fundraising campaign to help support Inside Israel. As you know, Inside Israel is free, and it always will be. I want to assure you of that. I don't want there to be any barriers between the stories I want to tell you about what it's like to be Israeli and to live here during these challenging times, and those stories reaching whoever wants to hear them. But of course, there are costs involved to producing the podcast. Uh, there's an entire production staff behind this, an audio editor, a producer, researchers, and various other costs. And so what I'm asking you tonight as the core fans and supporters of the podcast is to make a financial contribution to help support the pod. Uh, I've set a fundraising goal of $10,000, and that is approximately, it's actually a little bit less than the cost it needs, the cost needed to produce the podcast for an entire year. And we're actually just now coming up on the one year mark. I'm going to put the link right here in the chat if you would like to contribute. And for those of you who are listening on Apple or Spotify, you can just go to joelchazanoff.com slash podcast. And it's right there, the section support inside Israel. And people also, you know, they want to know how much should I give? And there's various ways to think about it. Um, if you enjoy the podcast week in and week out, then, you know, $10 a month, which would come to $120 would be obviously an excellent gift. $5 a month is also wonderful. But I want to make two things clear. First of all, truly any amount helps. You know, like I said, my goal is $10,000, but my real goal is that everyone would give. I think that even if it's a dollar, we all benefit when we feel like we have a stake in helping to make these stories get out there into the world and to be part of this journey. So really, gifts of $5, $18, 36 all those Jewish numbers, anything is appreciated. And of course, if there are any really big machers out there who want to give, I don't know, $1,000 or more, and you might be out there, well, of course, that would be welcome and appreciated as well. Anyone who does give $250 or more, that I consider sponsoring an episode. So if you would like to do that, to sponsor an episode with a gift of $250 or more, just let me know who you would like to sponsor that episode in honor of or in memory of, and, and we'll certainly do that, and I'll announce it on air at the right time. The second thing I want to say is that no matter what, the podcast is still going to be free. I know other podcasts have paywalls, and they offer special content if for those who give certain amounts. I don't want to do that. I really want whatever I know and whatever I can bring to you to be available for all at any time. So... I don't intend to put up paywalls or make anything uh, available only to those who give, but at the same time, I would like to ask those who enjoy it to uh, to support so we can help help these stories keep getting out there. So again, uh, the link is right here in the chat. Those of you online, joelchazanoff.com slash podcast. Next week, unbelievably, will be episode number 50. You know, I started this podcast on a whim in early October last fall, just because I wanted these stories to be told. I had no idea where it would go. I never dreamed it would still be up and running uh, 50 weeks later. And I, I see it going on no matter what happens here in Israel, because there's always a story to be told when you're living in Israel. Um, so to that extent that you're part of this journey and you've been with me all along and you are supporting it, I truly thank you. And now... Let's get on to tonight's episode. So like I said, the title of tonight's broadcast is, You Know That War Joel's Been Talking About. For 
Well, pretty much for as long as I've been doing the pod, I've been talking about the upcoming war with Hezbollah. And uh, I even referenced a few times that I might be the boy who cried war because I kept saying it was coming and it never really did actually come. Well, I think the war is here. And it might not look like what we expected war to look like. You know, when we think of war, we think of nonstop fighter jets and missiles and tanks and infantry walking over borders. But war in the year 2024 looks much differently than it does in even 15 years ago. You know, the last time Israel was in Lebanon in a major way was what, 2006, so 18 years ago. And that war pretty much consisted of us going over the border with tanks, with infantry, there were a lot of casualties. Uh, this is when the lone soldier Michael Levin was killed. Hard to believe it's already 18 years ago. Before he was killed, nobody knew who lone soldiers were. And then Mikey, this kid from Philadelphia who went to Camp Ramah in the Poconos, was killed in Lebanon, and his mother... Harriet was worried that no one would show up for the funeral. And so she put out a message to a few friends on Facebook, try to get 10 people to show up for Mikey's funeral on Har Herzl in Jerusalem, and thousands of Israelis showed up. When they heard that there was this lone soldier who'd come from Philadelphia in the USA to volunteer for the IDF, and ever since then, we are known. Lone soldiers now have a face, thanks to him. But that was the last time that Israel was in Lebanon in a serious way. So nobody knew what this next war in Lebanon would look like. And I'm telling you, this is it. It's happening right now. So let's just sort of unpack it a bit and give you a little recap. For the past 11 months, really since October 8th, Hezbollah has been attacking Israel. And we've had anywhere between 60,000 and 80,000 residents of northern Israel evacuated from the north. Now, let's think about that for a second. Let's take the conservative number, 60,000 Israelis. That's about one half of 1% of the population. So let's say a million Americans had to be evacuated from the border with Canada, with Mexico for a year. That's what they've been doing. One half of 1% of our population has been living in hotel rooms, with their children. I've said this before. You've been on vacation with your kids. It's fun for the first two nights in that hotel room. By night number four or five, it's cabin fever and everyone is at each other. Imagine doing that for 50 weeks. That's where we are right now. Uh, so we knew this war was coming. And just this past week, Netanyahu and the war cabinet added as one of the goals of the war. Remember, the goals of the war were to incapacitate Hamas and make sure they could never attack again. That was the main war and the main goal. And the second goal was to bring the hostages home. They just added a third goal, which is to return the northern residents to their homes, which seems like a no-brainer, but unbelievably, that was actually not a stated goal until now. But now that it is a goal, we really have to make sure and take steps that we can get our northern residents back to their homes. Everyone had been saying that by the start of the school year, which here in Israel, September 1st, it would happen. Obviously, it has not. And just another little piece of history, another twist, and I've mentioned this before as well. You know, Israel had a security zone with Hezbollah uh, from 1982 to the year 2000. We had troops stationed in southern Lebanon about 10 miles in maybe 15 miles in. This was called the security zone. And what it did is it pushed Hezbollah back from the border, prevented them for, from coming into Israel and prevented their missiles from hitting Israel. I was part of that operation. I was stationed in Lebanon for a while. We would go out every night looking for Hezbollah. Hezbollah would go out every night looking for us. It was a war of attrition that went on for 18 years. Well, we have a security zone right now. The difference is it's in our country. So instead of this security zone being in Lebanon and pushing them back, the security zone is in Israel, and we've retreated. And really, many Israelis see it as a sign of defeat that we've retreated into our own territory, and really, we've seceded the north of Israel to them. 
If you haven't been following closely, you might not know that a lot of northern Israel at this point is burnt up, literally burnt up from fires. It's been a very hot summer, and as Hezbollah has been firing, their missiles land in open forests, and fires start, and we've lost a lot of trees and acreage. And what we basically said to Hezbollah is, go ahead, fire at us all you want. We have no more residents here, so you can fire without causing casualties. You can look tough. Uh, and and we've been absorbing it for the past 11 months. So it seems like it's finally time for that to change. Now, when you think of a war beginning, you know, you would think of someone firing a missile, a shot, dropping a bomb. This stage of the war began in a very interesting way. It's a very famous story by now. You've all heard of it, probably. The, uh, the pagers that all exploded. Thousands of pagers exploded in the pockets and in the hands of Hezbollah operatives. Not just operatives, but really officers. It was an ingenious plan. Um, you can read about it other places, and I don't want to go deep into detail, but the, the basic gist of it is that Hezbollah no longer uses cell phones because they knew Israel could track their whereabouts with the cell phones. So instead, they went to pagers. And unbelievably, they switched their brand of pagers over the past half year because they wanted to make sure Israel couldn't infiltrate their communication system. And they bought thousands of pagers from, it turns out, a shell company that was opened up by Israel to produce these pagers for the sole purpose of selling them to Hezbollah. Hungary was involved. Norway was involved. There, there are a lot of details you can read that you know, I'm not fully familiar with. But in these pagers was a little bit of explosive, about three grams of explosive. And uh, this is a, an operation of many months, perhaps even many years. So this this operation could have even predated October 7th. And a few days ago, what happened is within a few hours, thousands of these pagers blew up. Um, the beepers beeped. And so what happened is a lot of the Hezbollah operatives took out the beepers to look at the message that would be written there. And it blew up literally in their face, uh, blinding them. Uh, more than, from what I'm hearing from my four, uh, sources, more than 40 of the Hezbollah uh, officers had their penises and scrotums blown off completely, which, believe me, no one in Israel here is upset about uh, at all because the pagers were in their pockets. What's really amazing is a new detail is that these pagers exploded not by the press of a button, but each one was detonated individually. So whoever was detonating these, and, and by the way, Israel hasn't taken responsibility for this. So what, I guess everything I'm saying is kind of conjecture, isn't really official. Uh, but Israel has not taken uh, responsibility for this. Everyone assumes it is them. Uh, but what happened is whoever did detonate these pagers, it was one at a time, and they knew exactly where each of these Hezbollah officers were at the time. And also, they did it at a, they de detonated them at a time when they would be as far away from as possible from civilians to really limit civilian casualties. So it's not like at one moment they all went off. It was over the course of several hours at the right time. Now, also important to know is when these went off a few days ago, this was actually not when it was intended to happen. Um, these pagers were supposed to go off probably a few weeks from now as the first stage of a war against Hezbollah. But Israel got word that Hezbollah was getting suspicious. I'm not sure what that means, but apparently Israel felt that it had a window to act and either it acted now or it would lose its opportunity. So they decided to go ahead and uh, forward with this, with this mission. But this really was the first phase of the war. And when you think about it, in the old days, what would be the first phase of the war? Probably knock out bridges, knock out communication systems, telephone poles, wires, satellites. Well, now it's to knock out the pagers. And once those pagers are down, now they can no longer communicate. Now it's an opportunity for Israel to go in with the next level of force. And what we saw is that Israel took out, I believe it was 14 members of Israel of uh, Hezbollah's elite Radwan leadership uh, force. These are, this is like their most um, elite fighting force. And they were actually in a meeting in an apartment building 
and this too is unbelievable. What they were doing is discussing plans for an October 7th style attack, but apparently one that would October 7th would pale in comparison with what this would be. The plan was to storm the Galilee um, and just like October 7th, murder as many people as possible, take as many hostages as possible back into Lebanon through a tunnel network. I've mentioned before that Hezbollah has a tunnel network as well. So when we took out these 14 members, uh, it was during a meeting where they were planning this uh, this operation against Israel. And, uh, you know, what can I say? Thank God that they were taken out. And in general, Israelis are, you know, I'll talk about this more in a second, how, you know, the Israeli psychology and how Israelis are seeing this. Uh, but it's, it's monumental. We're seeing these two operations as a... Uh, a bit of a return of the badass Israel that we felt has been absent for a while. And it's also very important to, to uh, Israel strategically. You know, experts here in security and in communications are saying that this, the explosions of these pagers, which, by the way, were followed by the explosions of radios. After these pagers blew up, a lot of Hezbollah operatives went to radios instead, and then those blew up the next day. So... We'll talk about the psychological blow in a second, uh, but it's really set Hezbollah back uh, in many arenas. And what I what I foresee is that Israel is now just going to pound harder. What that looks like, we'll talk about in a moment. But this is really the opening stage. Uh, whereas in the old days, you know, old days you'd knock out the bridge and the tower. Now it's knock out the leadership, knock out their communication system. How did Hezbollah respond this morning? I think as of this morning, Hezbollah has launched 85 missiles uh, at the Galilee. Most were accepted, the, uh, intercepted. They were fired very deep into Israel, much deeper than they've ever been before, but still not to the center of the country. But uh, schools were closed, uh, beaches were closed, Haifa and north of the country. Um, we did have one young man, a 17-year-old, who was killed last night. Uh, during one of the sirens in the north, um, I think he either lost control of his car or jumped out of his car too soon, um, so died not from the missile directly, but sort of as an indirect result. Let's talk about the psychology of Hezbollah here. First of all, I mean, there's no way around it. This is absolutely humiliating to Hezbollah. I've told you many times on this pod that in... I don't want to sound racist, but we have to talk about cultures here. This is a cultural thing. And you can't talk about the Middle East without talking about cultures. In the Arab world, honor is everything. Saving face is everything in the Arab world. And this looks absolutely humiliating to Hezbollah and to the Arab world in general. You know, at Passover, we say, Dayenu. it would have been enough. If thousands of Hezbollah pagers had exploded at the same time at Israel's hands, Dayenu. But the fact that Hezbollah purchased these pagers from Israel in the first place is absolutely, hum I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't get more humiliating than that to Hezbollah. And they look like fools to the to the Arab world. And so you're going to want to see Hezbollah retaliate, except I think my personal view is they're not sure how much they can retaliate. I mentioned that they'd fired, I think, 85 missiles and drones toward Israel today, and that most were intercepted. My hunch is that they knew most of these would be intercepted that they wanted to show strength. They wanted to show that they were attacking the Zionists. But they also knew that if they'd caused real, real damage, that Israel and possibly the U.S. would hit back 30 times harder. So I think Hezbollah is in a very delicate place right now. And you're hearing a lot of bravado that Syria might be joining in Iraq and the Houthis in Iran But you have to separate in the Middle East between the bluster and the action, between the bark and the bite. 
Now, God willing, I'm correct. And God forbid I'm wrong. You just don't know. But from what I gather from talking to experts and people who understand the Middle East, there's a lot of psychology at play here as well. So where is this leading? I mean, I think that's really the big question. In a way, there's really no way that this can be resolved without Israel going in on the ground. If we really want the residents of the North to be able to return to their homes, that means we need to make sure that the 10 to 15 miles of southern Lebanon is free of Hezbollah. Otherwise, they can sneak into Israel through their tunnel network or break through the border fence or continue to fire missiles at the north. So eventually, I think ground forces will have to go into Lebanon. Now, the key word there is eventually. That could be in four years. It could be that some sort of peace or agreement is brokered for the time being, and then Hezbollah will try to recuperate, and the residents of the north will return, but they won't truly live in peace until Israel goes in on the ground. It might even be more likely that this doesn't happen for at least a year, possibly two or more, because you know, our military is just completely spent from this year-long operation in Gaza. We have, you know, soldiers who are on their third and fourth stint of reserve duty. Physically, this is exhausting. Emotionally, to keep dropping out of college, to keep leaving your wife and kids, to keep leaving your job is exhausting. A few weeks ago on the podcast, this was only on Apple and Spotify. I had an interview with Yoav Cohen, who was a reserve soldier who'd served at that point over 100 days with his military reserve unit, unit in the North. And if you haven't listened to that, you really should, because he talks about the toll it takes on his kids, on his high-tech job. He has a very good high-tech job at a well-known company that he keeps having to leave his job to go back to Miluim. The toll it's taking on his wife. Yoav went back to reserve duty today for yet another stint. And uh, he asked us if we'd cook a few meals for his family while we're gone because he lives less than a mile away from us here. And of course we will. But listen to that podcast. Try to get a sense of what toll the toll is like for these reserve soldiers. We don't have it in us right now to fight an all-out war with Hezbollah in the north. So it might not happen right away. But eventually, I think we would have to go in on the ground. Otherwise, otherwise, you have, you know, a half a percent of your population living in terror all the time of the next big attack. And that's that's not a life. It's not one we can accept. What's the mood of the country like right now? Well, like I said before, this cell phone operation it brought back, I can't say joy, but it brought back that, oh, that sort of backslapping. There was a moment of like, yes, we've returned. We're not down for the count. Israel is back. The, the Israel we know who pulled off the Six-Day War, the raid on Entebbe, hunting down the Munich terrorists, that Israel has returned. And we felt really good for about 24, 48 hours. And we still feel good about it. But I want to make clear, we are not celebrating. We are not congratulating each other. We are not, uh, we do not think that the war is over and that finally tables have turned. We still have 97 hostages in Gaza. And the latest news today from the government is that only half of them are still alive, approximately 50. It'd been known, pretty much accepted, that 33 are already killed, which would leave, what, 64 alive. But now that estimate's been lowered to about 50 alive. So in no way are we saying, you know, wow, this is this is awesome. Finally, we, you know, the victory is at hand. We know there is still a long, long way to go. It does not look like the hostages are coming home anytime soon. At the earliest, 
it would be probably after the elections in the U.S. in November, because word is that Hamas wants to see what the new political scheme is in the U.S. and how it can leverage that. So we're talking at least, what, another six weeks, minimum seven? And even then, there's just there's not a lot of hope that the hostages are coming home. And believe me, plenty of times on this podcast, I've talked about Netanyahu not maybe giving the full effort to negotiate a deal. But a lot of a lot of Israelis right now are really losing hope that, or let's put it this way, we're waking up to the idea that our negotiating partner on the other side is a brutal, ruthless terrorist organization, and it's really there's nothing we could do. There's no deal we could make that would actually bring the hostages home right now because Hamas and the U.S. has said as much. Hamas is the one responsible for the lack of progress. Anytime Israel's agreed to anything, Hamas puts new demands. And then when we agree to those, they put new demands and they don't seem serious at all about actually bringing about an end to the war. And one of the reasons is they have fuel. They have food because of all the humanitarian aid that's going in. So one of the plans that's being talked about in Israel right now is a siege on northern Gaza. This is really just hours old, maybe a day old, this idea, but that Israel would give notice to the residents of northern Gaza that they have 48 hours or so to flee northern Gaza. And then after that, anyone, anyone in northern Gaza would be considered a target. And we would cut off all supplies and at that point uh, just choke Hamas off. Um, so Israel, you know, we Israelis, we really don't know where this is headed. So it's it certainly was wonderful to hear that the sly, clever Israel we love is a little bit back. Um, but it's too early to celebrate. There's still a long way to go, certainly with 50 hostages still in Gaza. As we speak at this moment, it's unbelievable that we're coming upon a year. And my neighbor, uh, Na'amal Levy, is still in Gaza right now. I also got to say that I feel the U.S., and this is just my opinion, I feel the U.S. has not been supportive of Israel's operations against Hezbollah enough in the past week. You know, Israel took out Ibrahim Akil, I believe is his name. This is a Hezbollah operative who was responsible for the 1983 bombing in Beirut that killed 241 Americans. There was a $7 million bounty on his head, and Israel took him out last week. And the most that the U.S. could say was, we're not shedding a tear. And then they went on to say that they didn't like the circumstances under which it was done. I mean, we eliminated one of the biggest most dangerous terrorist in the world, one who had blood on his American blood on his hands. And the US, that was an opportunity to really praise Israel and to show once and for all who stands for democracy and freedom and who doesn't. And uh, I feel personally, Joel, that the US did not live up to the task there. So where are we right now? It's uh, 12.30 a.m. here in Israel. I've mentioned before the idea of bubbles. There are different bubbles in Israel. I'm in this bubble in the center in Ra'anana. Had you been walking around Ra'anana, Tel Aviv today, you really would not have known that there was a war going on. Um, here and there, I've heard fighter jets. And you know, by the time you look up to see the fighter jet, it's long gone because they're traveling close to the speed of sound, if not faster than the speed of sound. Now, meanwhile, in the north, people are being, being told to stay near their bomb shelters. They were in their bomb shelters for much of the day as these missiles were falling. Like I said, schools were closed, beaches, hospitals had to reconfigure their patient wards. So it really does depend where you are in the country. And um, the biggest question for all of us is where are we going? No Nobody knows where we're headed next. At the moment, things are quiet. We feel like we have the advantage. 
but you just don't know. Not with the enemies uh, that we have and not in the neighborhood we live in. So tonight I'm going to address one question and one comment from all of you. So first the comment. This is from Andrew. He writes, I'm amazed at how so many Israelis, especially proportionate to the population, show up on a regular basis to rallies. For better or for worse, we don't have that kind of energy in the United States. And I agree. What Andrew is referring to is... Every Saturday night for pretty much a year and a half, we've had close to 500,000 people. Sometimes it's 200,000, sometimes 300. But think about that. Every Saturday night for, you know, this is pre-October 7th. This is judicial reform time, you know, January of 2023, well over a year and a half. You know, Israelis, I think, feel an attachment to their country that Americans don't feel. And I know that's painting with a very broad stroke, but I think the way Israelis are raised through the scouts and youth movements, through attending Memorial Day services and ceremonies when you're in kindergarten on, standing in silence on Memorial Day, standing in silence on Holocaust Memorial Day serving in the army, Israelis feel that they really are a part of the trajectory of the country, I think in a way that a lot of Americans, the majority of Amer Americans do not. And so, yeah, I think I think it, to me, it's not as surprising to see so many Israelis continually turn out. Believe me, I wish there were this kind of investment in the American future among Americans, the way Israelis feel uh, about Israel. Um, but yes, Andrew, I think that's a good a good comment and uh, acknowledged. And a question from Kathy. So Kathy asked Joel, how is it being back in Israel right after your trip to the U.S.? Those of you who were with me last week, we did it at 7 p.m., not 5 p.m., because I was in the United States. I performed at a conference called Ohio Loves Israel, which pretty much says it all. It was Hillel students, college students from all over Ohio coming together for one day of teaching and schmoozing about strategies, and then at the end, a comedy show. Uh, and I taught about ethics in the IDF, and then at the end of the day, closed it off with the comedy. And it was it was a great time. How is it being back in the uh, back in Israel? Well, I must admit, I mean, you come back to Israel and you're right into the story. There's no uh, there's no gradual acclimation to being back. I mean, I came back and uh, everything started with Hezbollah. Um, I, I must admit, I miss the calm a little bit, you know, in Ohio, in Columbus, where the lawns were green and groceries were cheap and there was parking everywhere. Like it felt very sedate and easy and yeah part of me kind of misses that um but it's at the same time uh, i'm glad to be back here it's an important time to be here obviously my wife and kids are here and so i wanted to be um be with them and it's very hard to be away from israel when there's something difficult going on here you know there are very few countries in the world where when there's a war people try to go back to that country but there's something unique about israel when war breaks out israelis feel a desire to go back and I felt that a little bit um, myself. It felt just kind of, it felt a little too distant when I knew all these things were happening and I I wasn't there. Um, so yeah, on the one hand, it is it is tough. This is a very tough time. It's more the question mark that's the most difficult part of all. We just don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I have no idea what's, what things are going to be like in December. Absolutely none. Um, no Israeli really does. Um, but you know, this is where I live, and there's no plans to leave right now. So in that sense, it is good to be back home. That is it for tonight's episode of Inside Israel. Again, I want to remind you about the chance to help support the podcast. I'm going to put that again in the chat right here, that link. And if you're listening at home, it you can go to joelchaznoff.com slash podcast, and there's a support the podcast link right there. Next week, I'll be in Israel as well. So it'll be 5 p.m. Eastern time. That will be the 29th of September. I leave for the United States for three months on Motzei Yom Kippur. So on the 12th of October 
at around 11.58 p.m., three hours, two and a half hours after the Yom Kippur fast breaks. Uh, I'll be flying in LL back to the U.S. for a three and a half month book tour and comedy tour. If you check out joelchazanoff.com slash shows, you can see all the places I'm going to be and uh, catch me on tour. Uh, I'd love to see you in person when I'm there. Please continue to send in your questions, your also comments, just a comment that you want to share that I can read on there. You can do that as well. The best way to do that is through the podcast page of my website. I will keep the chat open for a little bit, and I want to end with a thank you to all of you guys. Next week is going to be the 50th episode of Inside Israel. There's something special about that, and many of you have been with me the entire time. So a huge toda rabah. Signing off from Ra'anana, I will see you next week. Joel Chasnoff on behalf of Inside Israel. Laila Tov.